get your nose out of Instagram and just paint. And if you feel like you want some inspiration, open up some books or take a walk down the street or go to your local art gallery. Julie Markfield once stated, I find joy in the endless possibilities of creation. As I activate the surface with marks and washes of acrylic, my intuitive process begins. I have no plan of how the piece will unfold as I block out the structure subconsciously. My materials are varied and repurposed. Random cutting of paper and canvas scraps find their way onto the canvas. Hi there, everybody, and welcome back to my little corner of the podcast world to be on the palette. I'm Whitney Rosenson, your host and owner of Art Dimensions in Los Angeles. Today, I am really happy to be interviewing a fantastic new painter from the ADI roster, Julie Markfield. Julie and I have only just recently started working together, so I'm really looking forward to getting to know her better and for you all too as well. So let's welcome her in. Hi, Julie. Hi, Whitney. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Beyond the Palette. Thank you so much for guesting on the show today and for welcoming all of us into your creative world. All right, let's get going. Did you always feel that painting would be a part of your life? I think that it wasn't necessarily painting that I knew would be part of my life, but I knew that I always responded to all things beautiful. Okay. Like visually beautiful. Visually beautiful gardens, buildings, spaces, everything that I felt a certain connection to, but not knowing really why. Okay. How long have you been painting? I've been painting for 10 years now, but full time for five years. And for the listeners who don't know who you are, and I would say even for me, can you give us a brief snapshot of your journey to where you are today? Because I know you were in graphic design. Is that right? Yes, I was in graphic design. Well, my brief snapshot starts really in Buffalo, New York, where I was raised. I lost my father to a very obscure disease when I was 13 years old. And that was really a trigger for me to know that I wanted to be financially independent. I went off to University of Michigan. I studied poli-sci and realized that being a lawyer was not really my thing. I landed in art school, studying graphic design, as you mentioned, and in 1992 launched my company, CMG Design, where we did work for Fortune 500 companies across the country. About 10 years ago, I left the corporate world and switched my focus from graphic design to abstract painting. And in an odd kind of way, I really feel like when I started painting, my life began again. Oh, okay. So definitely a good thing that you started painting. (laughs) Definitely. I mean, how does what you experienced or learned in graphic design influence what you do with the canvases now? Well, I like that question because one of the things about non-objective painting or abstract painting is that you need to really understand composition. And composition is something that is just built in at this point into my DNA. I when I look at things, I I see positive and negative spaces, I see push and pull, I see where a line in a painting maybe just naturally needs to extend. So even though I wasn't painting for the last 35 years, I've been looking. And I think the looking and seeing as a designer uh, and as a creator and somebody who just loves all things visual has really helped me and pushed me along, maybe quicker than another young painter. So well said. What materials do you work with? My, my base materials are canvas and paper, 
but I really like to repurpose materials. During COVID, I did a series of paintings that I call my raw energy collection. And the raw energy collection was derived from um, mixed media and uh, cut materials that came from what I considered to be canvases and uh, that were not satisfactory to me. So instead of just keeping them in my shower, rolled against the wall, or in my daughter's old bedroom, I decided to cut them up and paint over them and repurpose them to uh, make something else. That's the direction that I'm currently working in is I guess you would call mixed media painting collage. Okay. And do you, what are you what are you up to in your studio? I mean, you just mentioned that, but is there a series name for this work that you're doing in presently in your studio with the mixed media and the collage? Or is there a new series you're working on? I'm just curious. I'm not working on a specific series, but I am having a show. And um, that show is March 24th, I believe. It's at the studio showroom of B. David Levine. So I'm working actually on changing up the scale of some of my work to make purchasing of paintings a little more accessible for people. So I've been working on some smaller pieces. Um, instead of working on things that are, you know, nine feet by six feet, I'm working on things that are, you know, 18 by 24. And I will say that for me, that comes with a whole other sort of ball of challenges. Okay. What? Well, first of all, that size is, I can see that that's easier for people to transport. But what challenges are you finding with that new smaller work? Well, I think it's really because when I'm working very large scale, um, there's a certain freedom that I feel with my body. It's about the energy really of uh, large body movements and fast instinctive marks and small hand gestures and eyes open and eyes closed and grabbing tools and just being very uh, free. And when I'm working smaller, I feel slightly constrained in how I'm producing the work. So the way I've handled it, I put on my wall a series of pieces of paper that read almost as one piece of paper. So I'm lining up, say, four 18 by 24 sheets on the top row and four on the bottom row. And I, I keep them together in a tight way so that I actually am painting as one as opposed to eight separate small eight separate. And then I pull them apart eventually. And then I work on them individually. So smart. So that's very cool. I didn't know you worked that way. So your emotions must play a big role in your work. And I know you use your intuition, gestural strokes, your closed eyes, opened eyes. How do your emotions affect your painting? They absolutely affect my painting. If I'm experiencing something as we all do, say I'm experiencing something that I consider to be relatively traumatic. It's a way of sort of feeling like I'm self-soothing by um, painting and, and pushing out energy onto a canvas. Yeah, that's such a great advice too for for people who are looking for something cathartic. It's very cathartic. And I think the most important thing when people are working is to not worry about what things are looking like and to just try to just get something out onto paper. And for me, the music that I'm listening to during these moments also really affects how I'm painting. The music I listen to is not something that is that's regular. It's just about a mood. I mean, sometimes I'll come in and I'll maybe feel a little angry and I'll decide that I really want to use drum music. And that just helps. It just helps. I put my earbuds in and I go at it. The music is chosen just based on your mood that day. 
Yeah, absolutely. The only kind of music I don't really like to listen to is soothing music. I like it to have a real energy. Vocals aren't necessarily necessary, but uh, sometimes there have, I did a series a few years ago where I would listen to violin and I would do marks on the paper, listening to violin. And then I would listen to something much louder and in your face. And it was interesting to see how that music actually translated to the canvas. And that's something that I'm still working on now is the translation of music to what happens on the canvas. What everything you just said has made me just clicked in my brain about when I think about the titles of your work. Yes. So the titles are very, to me, they're very whimsical. They're very catchy. They're fun titles. They're not, you title all your work, but are your titles based on, what are your titles based on? I mean, and can you name a few of them just so the listeners know what I'm talking about? Well, first of all, the title that the title that I really love is this big painting I did that I that I named Living in Kathmandu. And no, I've never been to Kathmandu. I would really very much like to go one day. But I do not know the name that the piece will be until it's all over. And I don't know if the music um, or the process of the piece or even the different passages that I see within these pieces really affects the name. It's really more about, there it is, it's done, and what am I feeling now? And the Living in Kathmandu piece is a classic example of, for whatever reason, I just felt like that's how I would feel if I was in Kathmandu. And that name became the name of that big piece. I'm going to tell everyone right now, I want you to check out my blog and I will have an image of Julie. We'll have some studio shots of Julie and this podcast will be embedded in the blog. So you can listen to it by going to the blog on artdimensionsonline.com and living in Kathmandu will be on there too. So you guys can see what Julie is talking about. All right. What do you hope people will get from your paintings in general? I've always wanted people to feel joy from looking at the paintings, but I also want them to just study them and look at them for a long time. That's one of the things that people have told me at the different shows that I've had over the years is how they look at it and they look at it again and again. And particularly um, people who have who have purchased my paintings. I have one good friend. He's my collector. Um, his name is Joe. He's been very supportive for years. He actually got a, in his company, he, he has a, a big printing company. He ended up buying a, a big piece that sits in their conference room. And what he talked about was really, um, particularly with the pieces that are in his house, is that he sees something different every time he looks at them. And that's, I get, uh, I get joy out of hearing that and that he loves looking at them and that when people come into his home, they ask him about the pieces. That's it. That's it. That's it. All right, I wanna go back to that quote that I read at the beginning of the show, that you have no plan of how the piece will unfold. So that seems like, an amazing way to start to not because when I when I go to paint something or when you know it just seems I feel like I need to have a plan a little bit of what's going to be on the canvas so what's your first so you turn on the music and you just move start to move is that how you how you work basically that's right but what I also do is I make sure that things feel somewhat in order um, in the space that I that my desk isn't completely messy and that I'm ready to grab some paint. I don't mix my paint ahead of time. I was just talking to some of my 
art friends about this and there is no real sort of color palette decision made ahead of time. But I do put up this big piece of canvas and in a strange kind of way, sort of begin a relationship with her. I, you know, touch the surface of the canvas and I make sure that it's stretched nicely up on the wall. I don't, I, I use loose canvas. I don't use stretch canvas. And then I do like to paint over the, the raw gesso that is on the canvases, unless I'm, unless I'm painting with a raw canvas, but I, I, I generally um, paint with, um, with gessoed, pre-gessoed canvas so that I don't have to go through that process. But I just really start, and it's really the mark making um, that sort of starts me off. I like to have access to different size brushes. Most of them are kind of junky brushes from the hardware store. I've given up on expensive brushes because I destroy them. I really like using um, sponge brushes and hardware store brushes, and I like using my hands. So um, my fingers primarily. I've used my hands for years, and I think there's something about the extension of your arm and your fingertips that allows a sort of freedom that brushes can't. That brushes can't. Yeah, and that happens. That happens really fast in my process. You know, sometimes I'll decide I'm going to use a big broom. You know, the tools are, you know, certainly with social media, there's, there's, people have all these ideas, you know, using your, using your household materials to sort of see what's different, see how it, how, see how a, um, a broom holds on to paint versus how a brush holds on to paint. But eventually what happens is um, forms start to appear. And then I start thinking about it a little bit more, but it's that really early time, like say the first hour or two, where it is really more play than anything else. And then shapes start to appear and you start to make some more conscious decisions. Thank you for explaining that to me, because when I heard or when I read that you didn't have a plan to the piece, I thought, wow, how is this going to, you know, how does the canvas really take shape? But you just explained it beautifully. So thank you. All right. This next question is pretty fun. If you were granted a million dollars for an art project, what would you do? I love kids. And I think that the idea of helping the underserved communities, particularly in Los Angeles, would be great. We've talked about, my husband and I have actually talked about for years, you know, what it would be like to actually just offer art classes to kids in our local community. And I think that that's, that's what I would do with a million dollars is I would start some sort of program for creativity and teaching kids how to explore their own emotions through paint. Fabulous. Just wonderful. Um, I would love to be in the know about that project if you guys get going on that. Okay. All right. What art do you show in your own house or do you only have your own work displayed? I have a lot of art. We've been slowly collecting art, which is a real privilege. I am the proud owner of my very first Joan Mitchell. And it's a very small little piece that I got last year as a gift. I have a, a very large photograph by a brilliant photographer by the name of Karen Savage. That sort of takes an important piece in my yeah. living room. But additionally, um, I have been collecting paintings of women uh, from flea markets and uh, various places for years. So the women are all around the house and my bathroom and my bedroom. And then there are some of my own as well. Okay, so a nice mixture. I want you to take a photograph of the Joni Mitchell and the Karen Savage. And okay, send... I'd be happy to do that. All right, do you mind if I put that on the blog? I wanna put that Yeah, on. sure, of course. All right, listeners, you've gotta look out for that too. You know, a lot of artists listen to this podcast. So do you have any advice for emerging artists who, out, who might be out there listening? Oh, I definitely do. My greatest is advice is get your nose out of Instagram and just paint. And if you feel like you want some inspiration, 
open up some books or take a walk down the street or go to your local art gallery because I feel that so much work that is happening today is being visually influenced by stuff that young artists are seeing, that there's a certain similarity that happens and that you should really be looking to discover your own voice. Not what you see on social. Not what you see necessarily on social media. Okay, great advice. Great advice. Uh, How do you stay motivated to keep creating? Probably the thing that motivates me the most is besides my art practice, I have a swim practice and um, I swim on a swim team here in Pasadena, California, and my day starts um, with some pretty rigorous swimming and that really gets me going. That's how I, that's what keeps me motivated is my time in the water. Great. And you swim every day? Five days a week. Five days a week. Wow. That's amazing. Julie. Thank you so much for spending some time with me this morning. Is there any, before we sign off, is there anything else you want the listeners to know about you? No, I don't think so. I just think that you should follow your heart. Yep. All right, listeners, you've got to see Julie's fabulous paintings on the Art Dimensions website, which is artdimensionsonline.com and at juliemarkfield.com. So it's Julie and then M-A-R-K-F-I-E-L-D. We're also both on Instagram at Art Dimensions and at Julie Markfield. So you can follow us there. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And to Julie and to all of you listening, I hope you have an amazing week and happy creating. Happy creating.